Okay, let's talk about chapter 10 in our textbook, X-ray production. So, um, one of the first things that I like to think about when I think about X-ray production, he actually introduces it later on in the chapter, um, so I'll find a, a textbook page for this. But this is a graphic, so it's on page 170 in our textbook. Um, this is, uh, like if you were to be able to see the x-rays that are exiting the x-ray tube as we're, whenever we turn it on, you would see something like a rainbow. You would see a spectrum of different energies that are exiting the tube. Um, and the continuous portion of that, and by continuous I mean this part that continuously moves from kind of left to right in this kind of almost bell-shaped curve, that is due to Bremsstrahlung x-ray production. And that's because of a statistical process whereby um, the, X, the electrons are moving close to um, the neutron of different atoms, and we'll look at that process. But depending on how close they get to the nucleus of the tungsten atoms, that de determines what energy x-rays they give off. So Bremsstrahlung can produce a wide range of energies. Um, anything from, like if I set, you know, in this instance it looks like the KVP was maybe set for 90 or something like that, because we're not going to see any energy higher than the kilovolt peak was set for, right? But we're going to see a broad spectrum of energies for everything underneath that KVP setting. Um, then we may see a few of these discrete, and so that's what I would call a continuous spectrum, continuous. So Bremsstrahlung results in a continuous spectrum of energies. Versus this over here it is a discrete spectrum, and you can say, well, how is it even a spectrum? What we see is a um, characteristic effect that results in these spikes um, at a particular energy level. Um, for instance, this one we know is right at 69 um, keV, and that's kilo electron volt, because that is the binding energy of the inner shell of uh, the inner shell electrons of tungsten atoms. And so there are characteristic spikes that occur at that level because, um, and the characteristic means that it's characteristic of tungsten. Um, that at that level we would see spikes in the energy right there, right? So you'll, you'll notice um, in Merrill's, like one of the reasons you might be thinking, well, why is that important? Well, how many x-ray techniques have you been told to memorize that are at 70 kVp, right? There's going to be a lot that are around 70 kVp. Why are we doing that? Well, because we're harnessing what we know about the, what we would call a k-edge, that right at 70 and energies below that are right at 69 and 70, we would expect to see a characteristic spike. And so we're using that to increase the overall average energy of the x-ray beam. We're using what we call a k-edge. We do that kind of k-edging type stuff quite a bit. So it's one of those things, like if you ever need to guess a technique with me, you can just say 70. I'll be like, yeah, that's probably good. Why? Well, because of the characteristic effect. It's not just that I'm... I think 70 is a great number or whatever. It's because I understand and I hope that we all understand it by the end of this lecture that um, that is a, a great technique because it's harnessing what we know about tungsten. So let's think about that characteristic x-ray production then we'll look at Bremsstrahlung. So um, in our textbook, characteristic is dealt with, um, let me see, on page like 167, we have an illustration in our textbook. Um, so what happens is again, this is this interaction. The way that we're talking about characteristic right now is within the X-ray tube. I want to stress that um, first and foremost because characteristic also likes to be a little confusing. Characteristic can also happen within the patient's body. Um, so when we look at contrast here in a couple of weeks guess what? There's a K-edge effect related to iodine contrast because characteristic effect could happen within that iodine contrast. Right? Um, there's characteristic interactions that could happen within the patient's body as well 
like within the oxygen atoms or carbon atoms of the patient's body, but those are not really high on the periodic table, so we would not expect to see the energy x-rays that they produce to be very strong. They're probably very weak. Um, but so the characteristic, the reason we call it a char characteristic x-ray production is because it is a characteristic of the atom where the interaction occurs. So within the x-ray tube, the atom that it's occurring within is within the anode, and so it is what kind of atom? Oxygen. No, I'm asking you what kind of atom, what element on the periodic table is that atom? that makes up the anode? Tungsten. tungsten. Good. And tungsten's got an atomic number of, I think, 75, right? So a high Z number, therefore it has a whole lot of electrons around it, right? Like 75-something electrons spinning around that tungsten atom. So it has a huge binding energy. It is doing a lot of work to keep those atoms, those electrons, spinning around that single atom, right? So it has a tremendous binding power. So it, the characteristic x-rays that we see within the x-ray tube are a characteristic of tungsten's binding energy. That's why we call it characteristic effect. But in this case, what we would happen is a projectile electron that has exited the cathode, and it is incident on the anode, attracted towards that tungsten anode. It comes within the K shell or L or M shell, of the tungsten, but we're particularly interested in the K-shell interaction, and I'll tell you why here in just a few seconds. But if it that projectile electron ionizes a K-shell electron, so if it knocks a K-shell electron out of the tungsten atom's orbit, then a electron from one of the higher shells will fall in. The electrons are lazy. They want to do less work. And so those closer um, valence shells have a higher binding energy, that means that the nucleus is doing more work to keep the electron in the shell, and the electron's not having to do so much work. So when it falls down into that, into that lower shell, it's going to have a loss of potential energy, and it's going to emit that loss of potential energy as an x-ray. And it will be a very specific number, because it's going to be characteristic of the binding energy of that shell. If you're curious what I'm talking about graphically, um, there's an illustration of this on page 168 in the textbook, and you can actually see what the binding energies for each one of these cells, uh, these valence shells is on figure 10-8. Uh, figure 10-9 illustrates how the electron may fall into that shell from any point either within the tungsten atom or its itself or outside of the atom. So the, the 69 keV x-ray photon that we're talking about that we think is so important um, is when a, an electron that's outside of the tungsten atom falls into the K shell of the tungsten atom. It would then emit a 69 keV x-ray photon. Um, you can see that we could have tungsten, we could have characteristic interactions at the L shell or the M shell as well. But look at the binding energy of the uh, L shell. Can anyone see what the binding energy is on figure 10-8 uh, of the L shell? What is it? 12. Negative 12. So they're expressed as negative expressions. It's negative 12 because it's a potential energy expression. And what is it at the M shell? Negative three. So there's a precipitous fall off in the binding energy from that K shell to the L shell, meaning that the K shell is holding those electrons really hard. But as we get further away, as we get out to L, M, N, O, those binding energies get really, really loose, really, really weak, right? Um, so that means that if I were to produce a, an X-ray from L shell characteristic radiation, the maximum energy it could be would be 12 keV. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to shoot any hand x-rays or anything other kind of x-rays at 12 keV. That's not, if anyone said, if I ask you, hey, what's a good technique for this? And you say, 
um, a kilovolt peak of 12, I'm going to say get out of my lab, right? Because that's scary. Like that's, that's not even dental x-ray. That's a really, really, really low energy. All that would do is that photon would, it, would, would attenuate within the patient's skin and be useless. It would ionize the patient's skin. It would not ever produce any kind of image. Are you tracking with me? So the, one of the reasons we stress the characteristic effect as only useful at the K-shell is because it is only at the K-shell that you could potentially produce an x-ray that would be of diagnostic value. I'll say that again. A lot of the test questions and a lot of the registry talks about characteristic effect like it only happens in the K-shell. That's not the case. It can happen at any shell of the atom. But it is important at the K-shell because that's the only time when we could have an, an X-ray photon that's produced that would be of diagnostic value. So at the K-shell, we could have, uh, uh, again, an electron bombard or ionize that tungsten atom. The photon that's produced when another electron drops down into that K-shell is going to be 69 keV. So according to Mr. Wolf, the Beyonce interaction is the Bremsterlong interaction. Um, and in this instance, what we have uh, is a projectile electron, again, um, incident on the tungsten atoms of the X-ray tube anode. And this is an interaction that is much simpler. This is only going to happen inside the X-ray tube. It cannot happen anywhere else. So characteristic is one of those foggy ones. Bremsterlung, no. It is just happens in the x-ray tube, and all it means is stopping. So Bremsterlung is the fancy German word for stopping. Um, maybe we can watch that YouTube video about German compared to other languages, right? But uh, it sounds like the name of a heavy metal band to me. But the amount of stopping energy that occurs relates directly to the energy of the photon that's produced, right? So the more the electron is slowed down, the closer the electron comes to the nucleus of the tungsten atom, the higher the energy of the x-ray will be. Because matter and energy can be neither created nor destroyed. So if the electron slows down a whole lot, it's going to produce a whole lot of x-rays, right? Um, now, he asks us to think about this statistically in this textbook, and I think that is helpful. Um, so you'll find a, a figure on page 166, figure uh, 110, that relates the um, kind of the, Bre the, the spectrum of Bremsterlong energies to the size of these tungsten atoms. Now, atomically speaking, right, the big part of an atom, they say, is, is empty space, right? Because this, these electron clouds, in comparison to the size of the atom itself, the electron clouds are very, very big, right? So the largest percentage of the atom's space is empty space, right? So that means that it is more likely that the Bremsterlong interaction will happen somewhere in those weaker parts of the empty space than in the really strong parts that are close to the little tiny nucleus, right? So that means that when we look at the kinds of interactions that occur, if you look at, at figure 10-5, uh, most of the energy is fairly low energy. The number of photons that are produced, most of them are low energy. Why? Because most of them are interacting somewhere further from the nucleus than close to the nucleus, right? And it's just a geometrical thing. Um, this results in a spectrum of energies on page 167 that is kind of a bell-shaped but bell-shaped curve, but the majority of it, if you see the highest number of interactions, occur at a lower energy. So this is showing a according to Bremsterlong interactions, a KVP setting of, of 60, right? But what is the average energy that we're receiving? 20-something, 20. 20 right? 20 and change. So 
that, that is hugely significant, right? That most of the brim stolong interactions, even though we really like brims, most of these brim stolong interactions are fairly low energy. Now, the good thing about that, though, and it feeds right into how we get pictures out of this, is allowing for a spectrum of interactions that is a continuous spectrum, almost like we said a rainbow, that is one of the reasons why we're able to see images on an image receptor plate, because we have what we call differential attenuation, right? One way to think about that is just like the color spectrum. Can you imagine if, if light did not produce different colors? right? Like in this room, think about all the different millions of colors that our eyes are able to perceive in just this one room, right? Can you imagine if our eyes could only perceive one color, what this room would look like? Right? It would be a considerably different room. Like my, my body would actually feel threatened by that room because I would not be able to perceive any very much about this room and like what's out to get me and what isn't, right? Um, the same is true with the x-rays. We have a spectrum of energies that are being produced by Bremster along, and that spectrum of energies results in different colors on our x-ray images, different shades of gray. Right? We are starting to harness that more and more to where we can actually start to do spectroscopy, especially with things like uh, CT. We're working on CT spect where we use a wider range of, of kilo electron volt energies and we're actually able to sample the different types of uh, atoms that we're seeing within the body. So let's think a little bit about these factors that are affecting the X-ray emission spectrum. As we, um, as we change the mass, the milliamperage per seconds, we will see um, uh, increase in the quantity of x-rays that are being produced, but we will not see a change in the quality or the energies of the x-rays that are being produced. So mass only represents the amount, right? One way they we used to talk about when I was in x-ray tech school is if it's like a shotgun, right? The mass is the amount of shot that's in the shotgun shell, right? Um, voltage, or KVP, whenever we increase it, it increases both the quantity and quality of x-rays that are being produced. And that is largely because it increases the energy of bremster long interactions that are occurring. So it increases the overall energy in the amount of bremster long interactions that are occurring. One way to think about that voltage difference would it be, it'd be closer to, like with a shotgun, the gauge of the shotgun, right? So, so the power related to the shotgun. Um, with filtration, and we'll look at this very closely, we'll spend the whole chapter looking at filtration in, in the spring, but we might as well start talking about it now. Whenever we add filtration to the x-ray beam, we will see an increase in the quality, but a related decrease in the quantity. We're basically getting rid of some of the weaker x-rays, and all that remains is the higher energy x-rays. Um, and this is illustrated uh, really accurately in our textbook on page 172. So if you need graphic representations of what's occurring here, MA is illustrated by figure um, 1014. You can see that as we increase the mass, we have a, if we double the mass, we have a double doubling of the quantity of x-rays that are produced, but the curve, the, the curve stays exactly the same shape, right? Versus with KVP, you can see as we've increased the KVP, we've actually shifted over the average beam energy. The same kind of shift in average beam energy happens with filtration. 
Um, target atomic number, and I think this is this is demonstrated on page uh, 171. The target material can be changed. For the most part, we use tungsten. I, I, I misspoke. It's Z number 74. I apologize for that. I think I was thinking of rhodium, which is 75. He talks about that a little bit in this chapter. Um, rhodium. Rhodium? I don't remember. But um, tungsten 74, and so if we go up to gold, which has an atomic number of 79, we would expect to see an increase um, in both the quantity and the quality of the x-rays that are being produced. But gold comes with its own problems, right? Tungsten, the advantage, one of the advantages of tungsten is it has a very high melting point. Gold does not have as high a melting point. And then we talked a little bit um, a couple of weeks ago about generators, different types of generators, and we talked about percentage of ripple related to the different x-ray energy production. If we increase the ripple that's related in the energy related to the, the generator, we would ex expect to see a decrease in both the quantity and quality. So we want to minimize ripple we want to keep our target materials relatively high Z number, um, like 74 or higher. Um, filtration is our friend if we're looking to improve beam quality. And honestly, where a lot of our work gets done is between the factors of mass and KVP. That's the majority of where our work lies. And you can see they kind of compete with each other in interesting ways. KVP does, is not going to let our lives be easy, right? Because it's going to increase both the quantity and quality. So whenever we're messing with the KVP, we've got to be considering that. Mass only changes the quantity. And quantity means like how many electrons are coming out, which... Creates... Which translates to the amount of X-ray photons that are being produced. Does that, does that affect the patient more? Yes. More? Yeah, um, good question. Anytime we're producing more x-rays, we are also potentially exposing the patient to more x-rays, right? So whenever we double the mass, we're also potentially doubling patient dose, right? Um, KVP is one of those that it gets a little foggy. But basically, as we increase the KVP, we are potentially reducing the patient dose. I'll say that one more time. As we increase the KVP, if all other factors remain the same, we are potentially reducing patient dose. Because as these energies get higher and higher, eventually these photons would be able just to pass straight through the patient without any interaction. Right? There's gamma rays from the sun that are of such a high energy, they pass straight through our body every day without any interaction, right? Um, same thing happens with high KVP. Um, they, they may potentially pass straight through your body without any interaction, okay? Um, so we might ask, well, why don't we just shoot all of our x-rays with a really high KVP if that's basically a way of reducing patient dose? But the what would be the problem with that? Well, file that, file that question away in the back of your mind because it is what we're going to talk about when we talk about image creation, right? But if I'm telling you that if we increase this one factor, mass, we increase the patient dose. So in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, well, okay, that's great, but why would I ever increase that factor? Right? Why wouldn't I want to keep my patient dose as low as possible? Therefore, never mess with the mass. We'll look at that in just a second. With KVP, I'm saying if you increase the KVP, you could potentially reduce your patient dose. But the problem lies in what kind of picture comes out of it. Okay? So just file that question away because we're going to come back to it. But um, here, is another, here again is that graphical representation. And with mass, you see, if we go from um, 200 MA to 400 MA, the curve, the shape of the curve remains exactly the same. 
but we've doubled at every possible level of the curve. We doubled the number of photons that are being produced at that given energy. So we've doubled the exposure. All right? Um, with KVP, if we increase the KVP from 72 to 82, right, um, you can see the, the shape of the curve has shifted. It's shifted slightly to the right. Okay? That means that the average energy has also shifted slightly to the right. That means that we've increased both the quantity and the quality of the x-rays. How much energy, average energy, is in that beam. With filtration, when we go from 2 millimeters of added filtration to 4 millimeters of aluminum filtration, um, we have reduced the, the, the shape now, right? We've reduced the quantity of x-rays that are being produced, but we've also shifted the peak over. I'll draw on it real quick. Now let me zoom in. Filtration's a tricky one. So here is the peak right here for the two millimeters of added filtration. When I double the filtration, I shifted down in the amount of x-rays that are being produced, right? but I've also shifted the peak over, so the average energy has gone up. The average energy has moved up. So I reduced the quantity, but increased the average energy of the x-ray beam. And then finally, with generators, we want to make sure that they're as high as possible, because we can see with a high-frequency generator, or like with portable machines, we're using a DC generator, um, we'll have an increase in both the quantity and quality of the x-ray beam overall. So, um, here is kind of moving towards what happens with image creation with these different interactions. As we increase the mass, the beam quantity is going to be increased proportionally. So if I double the mass, I will double the intensity. I will double the, the quantity of x-ray photons being produced. And receptor exposure would likely increase as well. Right? Receptor exposure would increase as well. KVP, if I increase the KVP, it says the quantity increases geometrically. So that's a fancy way of saying that it's not proportional, right? We're going to have to use some geometrical thinking. We're going to have to really hone in on these graphs in order to figure out what's happening with the KVP. And we're going to use some rules to memorize what happens with KVP. It's not as easy as mass. Mass is as simple as if I double the mass, I double the quantity. If I half the mass, I half the quantity. And that's both of the x-rays that are being produced and the image exposure, right? With KVP, I'm saying the receptor exposure will increase. It is not going to be proportional. It's going to be weird. With distance, as I increase the distance, that is re reduced geometrically. And so we, re we compare that to the inverse square law, right? That's the best way that we can shape are thinking about what happens with changing the distance. We re geometrically reduce the beam quantity. We will also reduce receptor exposure as the source to image receptor distance increases. As we increase the filtration, we will reduce both beam quantity and, ex and receptor exposure. Both of them be will be reduced by filtration. Um, but we potentially can also reduce patient dose.